Hello and welcome. This is James from the DSO Imager channel. Uh, today's video is going to be a uh, work through or workflow of uh, PixInsight geared towards beginners. Now I've been uh, doing astrophotography now for a few years. Uh, there's a link to my astro bin on my banner on the YouTube channel so if you're interested in seeing some of my work you can definitely check it out there and of course the uh, other videos on my channel uh, but uh, I've taken the the experience that I've had and I've put everything together into a concise list of um, steps that I think will help people that are brand new to Pix and Sight uh, to get um, to get their feet wet with this the goal here is just to have the bare minimum steps needed to make a nice picture uh, with the data that you've captured help build up some muscle memory uh, so that you're comfortable uh, with the interface and uh, then you can start to um, do more as you learn more. Now you can see uh, I've broken it down into seven steps uh, before, but before we go over this I want to cover just a couple other things to kind of uh, get everything in place that we're going to need. We're going to want to get uh, some scripts and I'll show you how to do that and I'm going to give you a brief uh, uh, tutorial on how to use some of the tools uh, that we're going to use or how the GUI works here. Now the nice thing about PixInsight is that anybody can develop packages for PixInsight uh, and there's some really outstanding packages out there. A lot of them are for free, some of them cost money, uh, but where you go to manage those is under resources here and you go to updates and then you do manage repositories and you can see that we just have some addresses in here so the one that we're definitely going to want is this one right here this dark archon and that's the uh, the address so actually I mean the websites right here right and you just put this link in there right so he's explaining resources update manage rep uh, manage repositories so I mean that's all you do you click add you put that address in there you click OK uh, then you click OK then you go back you go updates check for updates with that address newly added in there it's gonna go ahead and find it now obviously I'm I already have the updates in there but it'll find it it'll download those updates uh, then you just need to uh, exit out of PixInsight, go back in, it'll install the updates. And then once that's in there, if you go to scripts, uh, you should then see an entry here for easy processing suite. And we have all these awesome tools that we can play with. We're only going to use a couple of them today, but uh, yeah, f for a free update, this is really awesome. And, um, you know, if you want to make a donation or so, Certainly not a bad idea given how powerful this uh, software is. All right, so next I do want to go over the screen function, uh, screen transfer function. This is a very handy tool, um, and you can find it under um, intensity transformations and screen, fun screen transfer function. Now, we're not going to utilize the full abilities of this tool uh, but I wanted to get uh, a couple of um, points across so this is uh, the image that we're going to use for uh, this tutorial and this is just three hours of uh, the Cygnus wall taken with a one-shot color camera an ASI 533 MC uh, the telescope I used was an astronomics AT 115 EDT now this data has been stacked in PixInsight. I use dark frames and I use flat frames for my calibration files. So you get your stacked file, you open it up in PixInsight and this is what you see, right? We don't see anything in here. The screen transfer function tool or STF as I'll refer to it going forward. Uh, one of the things it lets you do is that if you hit this, uh, this nuke button, it applies an auto stretch and it just uh, it, it, it gives it a very aggressive stretch and the value here is that it lets us see 
what there is in here without actually making any changes. This tool does not make any permanent changes on this. So we're just using it to see what we have and to allow us to manipulate the data before we're stretched. All right, so you'll hear the terms linear and nonlinear. Basically what that means is that there are some things that you can do to your image before you apply the initial stretch. And so that's uh, where this comes in useful. So I'm going to go ahead and hit that nuke button. Now this actually doesn't look too useful because we're getting a green image here. Now if you see this, don't worry, don't panic. All it's done is a linked auto stretch of RGB, right? See how this uh, chain here is selected? So that means it's linked everything together. And in uh, color cameras, you have two green pixels for every blue and red. So it's not a surprise that green's a dominant color here. Uh, the way we can get around this with the STF tool is to just click on this chain to unlink. So now these channels are unlinked and it's going to apply an auto stretch individually to each red, green, and blue. And that's going to give us a, a better idea of what we're actually looking at here. Now remember, we've not changed anything. We're just, we're just changing the view so that we can see what's in here. But this picture still has not been stretched, has not been processed, or anything like that. Uh, and you can use the F12 key on your keyboard to toggle. So there, I hit F12 and it's removed the, the, the we'll call it the temporary stretch or the visible stretch and just toggle back and forth. All right, so let's get started. Uh, here's the workflow again. I'll uh, copy this into the uh, description of the video, uh, but we're gonna start with crop. We're gonna do a dynamic background extraction. Then we're gonna apply color correction. Then we're gonna apply a stretch. So we got at least three steps prior to stretching. And after our, our stretch, we'll work with some curves and masks. Uh, then we'll sharpen with unsharp mask. And then we'll do noise reduction. Uh, these last two steps, honestly, I consider them optional. Uh, it's, you don't have to do this. And it's also two areas where it's possible to actually um, overdo it and, and kind of uh, impact your image negatively if you go too far. So we'll call that... Uh, these last two steps is optional. All right, so dynamic crop. That's under geometry. Now, the reason we're wanting to crop here first is you, you're likely going to have some stacking artifacts. They're not too bad here, but you can see them. Depending on uh, how good your um, or your tolerance is on uh, aiming and centering, especially if you do multiple sessions, uh, you might have much larger stacking artifacts. Uh, your tracking mounts, uh, your mounts tracking abilities, your dither settings, all of that will impact it. But the bottom line is you'll have some artifacts along the edges. So we're just going to crop that out. Also, if you've got issues with really bad stars on the corner or um, other kind of undesirable artifacts here you can see a stacking artifacts pretty good here uh, zooming in and out I'm just using the mouse wheel in case that wasn't wasn't known but anyway that's what we're gonna crop so I'm just gonna crop this out there we go And uh, make sure you close Dynamic Crop after you've used it, because it, leaving it open sometimes can cause some interference with some of the other uh, processes. All right, so we're going to go to Dynamic um, back, Background extra, um, Extraction. Now, they have an automatic background extraction, and it would seem to think to make sense to use that as a beginner. But Automatic Background Extractor does some weird things sometimes and dynamic background extraction is not really that difficult so we're gonna go with this and I'm gonna show you how to do this so you click on the image it opens up these four quadrants uh, then we have 
a couple of settings here. Under model parameters, we have tolerance and shadow relaxation. Uh, for tolerance, go ahead and put a 2 in there. And for shadow relaxation, put a 6 in there. These values work great on just about every image I process. As far as where I got these values from, uh, actually, uh, Sean over at Visible, Visible Dark, he uh, uses these settings, and uh, I picked those up from him, and yeah, they work great. Uh, the other neat thing about Pixinsight, if you ever have a question about what a specific field does, just hover over it, and invariably you'll get a little pop-up that gives you some information about uh, what that does. All right, so after we do this, we need to do our reference points. Now, sa uh, sample size, this is going to depend on how large your image is. All right, so if, if I want to place a sample here, for example, it does a tiny little box. What I try to do is I want a, I want a larger box than that, uh, but we don't want any stars or any, any kind of structure in the box because we're ideally trying to get a background, a sample of the background. So I will uh, usually increase this size. And of course, it's going to matter. It's going to depend on the resolution of your image, whether you drizzled it or not. Uh, but we'll we'll stick with 45 for this example. Now, if you put a block and you don't you don't want it there, you can just hit the delete key and it's gone. Uh, if you click in there, it puts it back. If you want to move it around, just use the left mouse button and you can drag it to wherever you want. Now, as far as what to do, where to place these, there's two rules of thumb that I follow. On an image, it's full of nebulosity like this. Really, just putting one reference point in each corner or close to each corner actually does pretty well. And so I'll just stick one. I'll try to look for an area that's got minimal stars. And, uh, oops, an extra. Delete it. Uh, this tool requires a minimum of three reference points. So, I mean, it's even if you get a part where it's so dense that you can't find an open spot and you've tried reducing the size and it's not going to work, if you get at least three in there, that should be good enough. Uh, then you go down the target image correction, set it to division. We're going to run this twice. So set it to division, put a check a checkbox next to discard background model. If you leave this unchecked, when it uh, when it applies to your image, you'll get a second copy, and it'll just show you where your gradient is. Uh, that's what this tool is mostly for, by the way. Is it's a great it's a great tool for removing uh, light gradients. So if you've got light pollution sources, especially from one side versus the other, uh, this tool does a tremendous job uh, with it, and it's why we do this. Now, generally, we run this twice. I run it with a division, and then I run it with a subtraction. Uh, so the save your reference points that you put in, grab this little um, triangle here, and just click it and drag it down. And now what we've done is we've saved an instance with our settings uh, of this. So if we want to open this back up with our reference points already in there, we can double-click this instead of opening up a new dynamic uh, DBE uh, window. Now to apply this, I'm going to hit the green checkbox and we get a new image. And we'll hit this and we can see the difference here. So it did pretty good. So we'll close that. And as I said, we're going to we'll want to run it again. So now I just have to double click on this. See, it puts everything back in place. Only this time I'm going to change it to subtraction. And there we go. And that looks pretty good. And that's what we're going to work with. Okay, now before we go forward with this, I want to show how you would use this with, um, with uh, galaxies, right? So I mentioned one in each corner on a pretty heavy nebula image where the whole image is nebula works pretty well. But for galaxies, 
that doesn't work quite as well. So we're going to take this here. This is a, a four hours Leo triplet. Uh, you can see there's all kinds of problems going on here. We have a pretty strong light gradient um, because uh, this target kind of rises right over my main light pollution dome in my neighborhood. And of course, we've got some problems with uh, calibration files, right? We got this here. We got this big bright thing in the middle, so flat frames are not doing so great. Um, normally, you would want to reshoot your flats or whatever, but for the for this video, we're going to run with this and see what we can do with dynamic background extraction. And so, here's uh, the process that I saved here, and see how I've got a check boxes all over the place or reference points all over the place and this really seems to help with galaxies or planetary nebula if your image has a large empty star field this is uh, where it's beneficial to do this now let me close this real quick the way you would do this is you go back right like before do our same settings tolerance of two shadow six uh, we're gonna bump this up to I don't know 25 uh, it's automatically has a samples per row 10 so I can click generate and it will put all of these this grid in here for us if I want to make larger if I look at this I'm like oh I want larger reference points I can change the size and hit resize all and it'll change it for us um, what you do then is you zoom in and you just make sure that you don't have any bright stars in there inside the boxes also uh, I will caution you if your goal is to get uh, IFN integrated flux nebula light dust uh, dynamic background extraction can destroy that pretty well it's that's how it's effective it is so like you can see the little tidal stream coming off of the hamburger galaxy here we would not want to put any reference uh, points on that and we don't want any reference points on the galaxy itself so I will either delete them or try to move them out in these case in this case I'll just delete these So you would just go through and basically get your reference points off the stars and little galaxies or whatever. Any Basically any area that's got information or data, you don't want the reference point to cover that. All right, so rather than go through that whole process, let me just show you how it did. So this was the first pass of dynamic back background extraction. Right, that did a really good job on that. And this is the second pass. So even better. Now it looks noisy and everything, but don't worry about that because uh, we can do our color calibration and stretch it. And that gives us something to work with. Even this we can work with in uh, post-processing. That would be a little bit more of an advanced technique. And I do have uh, steps showing how to deal with that in some of my other videos. All right, so let's move along. Now, I do want to show something uh, that will be interesting here. So we did dynamic background extraction. It removed the gradient. It also removed that, uh, that, green, that uh, green signal, the, the overpowering green signal, right? So here I've locked the channels, and it's green. This one has dynamic background extraction. Channels are locked now. I'm going to hit this auto stretch and there. So the green's gone. Now it's very red, uh, but uh, we, can, uh, we can do some more work on this. So we're going to do some color calibration. And there's a few different ways to do color calibration, and I'm just going to show you the real easiest way. Uh, we don't even have to make any changes here with this background neutralization that's the first step just drag and drop this onto the image and it's going to apply a neutralization now you may see a change here 
but remember we have a uh, auto stretch applied and we've actually changed it so to see if there was any changes we need to hit that nuke button again and you can see some mild changes in there after background neutralization we go back to color calibration and we hit the actual color calibration and we can go ahead and drop this on there too default settings are fine most of the time now this doesn't look right but again remember it's using the previous we're, we're seeing it with the previous version of the auto stretch so we need to hit auto stretch again and so now we've got a more uh, uh, balanced uh, color here if you want to go further with this tool basically what you're doing here is you would make a preview box right and you want to do a preview box on an example of of for a white reference and a dark reference and that works too right there's your background reference sometimes uh, you get weird results and a lot of times I just find that the default stuff works just fine uh, if you make images another quick gooey thing here if you have all these little preview boxes and you want to delete them just go up here preview delete all now those are gone alright so anyway with uh, color calibration done we're now ready for stretch so we're going to use that easy processing stretch I mean you could do it the manual way intensity uh, histogram uh, but uh, I think at least for starting out this easy soft stretch does a really nice job and you get a preview here of what it's going to look like with your stretch and you can even tweak these sliders here a little bit and it will you'll see it update in here so it's it's useful for seeing seeing what kind of changes it's gonna have but for now we'll just stick with the default settings and we're gonna run that and there so now this image is now stretched if I hit the F12 key it doesn't notice it doesn't it doesn't darken because we have a stretched image now alright so let's uh, play with some curves here so intensity transformation curves transformation and curves is where I end up doing most of my work in my images All right so we want to build a little contrast so usually I'll start with an initial S curve oops you don't see any change do you right see this little uh, round circle here this opens a preview so now as I make changes to the curves we can we can see it so we're gonna want to do our initial contrast and then you hit this button to execute now after you hit the execute what it shows here since there's still a curve applied here it's you're seeing what a next application of the same curve uh, is going to do so you hit this little reset button to reset the curves and that's where we're actually at now this image looks a little dark to me so I'm gonna go ahead and grab in the middle and just kinda drag it up a little bit uh, but we don't want the dark areas to get too dark so I can grab down here and pull pull down Now I want to show you something else. See this? So I'm putting the mouse pointer anywhere in the image and I hold the left mouse button and now if you look at the histogram you can see where on the curve that point is. So you can see the green, the red, and the blue. If I move it down to these darker areas you can see that it's getting darker. So where this is useful is let's say we want to this area here it's not super dark but you can see where this area is at on the histogram and if we want to create some separation between this and the spot right next to it we can move up and see where this area is just a little bit brighter than this area so this gives us an idea of where to go on the curves so now I can put it where that darker area is and just pull it down a little bit and then go to where the brighter area is and pull it up a little bit and just apply a couple of that and you can see the change that's having in here 
So it's a good way to, to, to have more control. The, the, the subtle adjustments give you more control than doing drastic stuff, and it can help uh, keep things from getting away from you while you process this. Uh, now, we would like some color, some more vibrance in here perhaps, so I'm going to hit the saturation tool. I'm just going to drag it up. That looks pretty good. And of course, this is all subjective. You know, some people like a lot of color. Uh, one thing to be aware of, as you increase saturation, you're also increase, increasing the noise. So if you like really bright, vibrant colors, uh, you're going to introduce a lot of noise, and that can cause you problems later. So give it a little bit more. So now let's let's uh, talk about masks. Uh, what if we want to do some to make this area here stand out more from the back of this? Uh, we can use a range mask. We don't need that anymore. So mask generation, range selection. Hit the preview button and grab this slider here for upper limit and start pulling it down. And what it's going to do is reveal the brightest parts. Right? So if you go all the way, it's the whole image. But we just want to isolate the wall itself. And then smoothness. I always do smoothness. If you don't do smoothness, then you can get a real unnatural uh, look as far as, you know, basically think of it as feathering, right? All right, so we can close our preview window. There's our mask. To apply the mask, we grab this tab and place it right here. Okay, uh, one thing, if you take the tab and put it there, you make a clone. And this works for any window. All right, now you see the mask applied. Now, obviously, if we want to work on this, we need to change this. Well, we can just go up to mask and invert mask, and there we go. I'm going to minimize that and close that. Uh, we're going to take a preview box, and we're going to just draw a preview over here so that we can see what impact our changes have. Now, to get rid of this part, just hit this uh, this button here. This hides the mask. So the mask is still there, but now it's not interfering with our view. Now I'm going to go ahead and open up curves again. And let's see. So we can maybe increase saturation here. Notice how it's only impacting the area that is... Uh, that's unprotected by the mask. Also notice you can see better the noise that's being created if we do too much. We just want to do a little bit here. Oops. And maybe we want to do some uh, uh, do some more contrast, right? So you can kind of see in this now it's all red mostly so we're just going to look at the red line and get an idea of where we want to adjust that curve so we're going to pull down here pull up here to give it some separation now I'm going to go ahead and close this real-time preview because we want to apply it if you apply it while you're in a preview it doesn't apply it to the actual image so I'm going to be zoomed out here drag and drop and there we go so made a change there um, if we don't like the way this did these two buttons here this is your step back and step forward we can just undo that step by that and you can also toggle and see the difference that it had So to be honest, personally, I didn't like uh, what that did. So we'll go back to the preview 
and maybe what we just need to do is brighten this a little bit we'll still bump saturation up a little yeah that's looking better now we may want to do some tweaks to the areas that are currently protected so we can go back to mask invert mask again and now we can do some work to these outer areas and maybe we just want to brighten it up as well Yeah, a little bit more. Maybe increase saturation a little bit. See what this does. Yeah, it's all subjective at this point. Now, another uh, tip is that we can take the color out of these darker areas and that actually helps the darker dust areas pop out. Uh, so to do that we're going to need to make another range mask. Now I removed the current mask that's on there by hitting the little X there to remove it. We're going to go back to mass generation and this time Basically, we want the whole area except this darker area. And of course, we'll smooth this out again. So I'm going to go ahead and open a preview here. Notice that the mask is applied, but not visible when we open up a preview like this on the whole image. Now, a couple things to keep in mind. This dust, it kind of looks like it's a hole, right? But it isn't actually a hole. It's in front of the nebula. It's, this is uh, thick dust that's blocking the light. So we don't actually want this to be that dark. So we can try to lighten it up a little bit. And there's also interesting structure in here where there's darker uh, flows of material. So it is nice to not let this area get so dark that it just looks like a, a hole in space. You do have to be careful, right? Because there's a mask. So if we go too much, right, it, it, it doesn't look right. It looks unnatural. Uh, but I think this looks pretty good. But what we we'll want to do now is take some of the color out of here. And so we can go to saturation and pull down. And you see how there was kind of like a greenish hue into the dust? By dialing back to saturation, we're removing that green. Now, of course, we have stars here. You don't want to go too too aggressive with taking saturation out, otherwise we, we kill the color in our stars. Uh, but um, it still has a nice effect on the dust. Now, as you get more comfortable, one of the next things you'll learn how to do is how to remove stars and add them back in. But again, just for a very uh, getting started beginner level, we're not going to worry about that. Now, uh, let's talk noise reduction. Um, I was hesitant to put this in here because I don't want um, people to think that it's it's uh, super important. Although, if you're starting out, chances are your your initial images uh, they're going to be low um, integration time, right? Maybe 40 minutes or so, and so it's going to look pretty grainy, which is normal and to be expected. But you may feel uh, compelled to uh, do something about the noise, so. Uh, I'll show you two different ways of handling this at this stage. Now the Easy Processing Suite does have a denoise uh, function and it uses TGV and MMT. So these are both separate 
noise reduction functions that you can use in Pigs in Sight. You don't need uh, this script to be able to utilize this. But the nice thing about the script is that in order to use both of these correctly, you need to have uh, masks set up, and they've got to be perfectly designed to run this uh, noise reduction, and the script will um, create the mask for us. So that's handy in of itself. And um, other than that, it's just hitting the button and letting it do its thing. Now, uh, generally, you would run this script while, the, uh, while your data was still linear before the stretch. But um, I've run it at this stage after everything's done, and it actually does a decent job. And under normal circumstances, I mean, TGV and MMT, you might run after the stretch anyway. So it's, you know, something that you can experiment with before or after the stretch, but at least just for uh, getting it knocked out at this early stage, uh, still learning picks in sight, uh, it actually works pretty well here. And I'm not going to make any changes. And the way you would do it is you just hit run and it'll run. Now, it does, I got to warn you, it does take a long time. Like on my computer with uh, with a 16-core um, AMD processor, uh, it still takes like 15 minutes to run. So uh, now, granted, this is a drizzled image, even though it's a small chip from the 533. It is drizzled, so it does take a while to chew on it. Uh, so I'm not going to click this now. I've run it already, and I'll show you the results. So when it finishes, I made a clone. And uh, when it finishes, it generates these masks. And by the way, these masks uh, could be pretty handy with um, other things. I mean, you can certainly reuse these masks. And uh, the end result is this here. So it's really subtle. Now, this image wasn't too noisy to begin with. Uh, but maybe if we zoom in here. Yeah, so, I mean, you can, I don't know how well this shows up on YouTube, but uh, there's a little bit of a grain in there, and uh, that's with it applied. So it just, it just took the edge off a little bit. So, I mean, especially on this picture, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's optional, right? These newer sensors are so clean that if you get uh, a, a few hours worth of data on there, and your focus was good, and your tracking was good, you're going to have a really low noise image to begin with. Now there is a, a, I mentioned that you can buy packages as well. Let's make another copy here. Uh, the other option is to go to, um, is to uh, get Noise Exterminator. This is from Astro, uh, Russell Chrome and Astro, RC Astro, and uh, this program, for one thing, works a lot faster. You got two sliders here, one for denoise, one for detail. And um, this also works with a preview. So you can open up a preview and take a look. And it is a lot faster uh, than the other options there that we had, that we just did with the Easy Processing Suite. Yeah, and it does a really good job. Look how clean that is. So we can just apply this to the whole image. I'll go ahead and pause the recording. I'll be right back. Okay, and it just finished. It's a lot faster uh, than uh, doing it the other way, and uh, you can even enable GPU support, and it'll be even faster. And here, we'll compare the two. So at least on this image, this data was pretty clean to start with, and both of them worked pretty well. So anyway, this is uh, this concludes my uh, beginner PixInsight workflow video. Uh, if you are new to PixInsight and this helps you out, uh, please give this video a like. Uh, 
I would love to uh, hear how people have done using these steps on their own images. If there's any improvements that can be made in this video or if you have any questions, please put a comment uh, down below. Uh, a lot of the content on my website is more intermediate level. Uh, so there's plenty to look at after you've gotten the basics down. And uh, if uh, you subscribe to my channel, uh, you'll be able to see the, uh, all the workflow videos that I do for my images. And for my more experienced uh, viewers out there, if you guys have any suggestions on anything that's missed or how I can do things differently, feel free to comment below. So that's all I got. Uh, hoping everyone gets some clear skies and have a good day. So long.